we'll be moving on to the next part of our lecture uh, of the program today. That is the college lecture. And that will be sponsored by the CIDES. Uh, we are thankful they are generous uh, sponsorship. So today we have Dr. Gayani Nadisha Nishanti, consultant nephrologist from Teaching Hospital Anuradhapura. She is MBBS, MD, ESC Nephrology, member of International Society for Nephrology, and associate member for RCP Edinburgh. Among many achievements, she won the most innovative outstation physician award last year, 2022, from the Ceylon College of Physicians. Thank you for that kind introduction and giving me this opportunity, dear sir. My today's topic is CKD early diagnosis, screening and prevention at uh, primary care level. So is that CKD screening and early diagnosis important in our country? Yes, because CKD is a burden to our country. In Andhra district, only there was 10,677 patients were diagnosed with CKD and nearly 4,000 patients died with CKD since 2019 up to 2021. We do not have recent statistics. And the point prevalence was much, much higher in Anuradha Pradesh compared to Kolonnaru. And the nearly 2,000 patients per year newly diagnosed with CKD. However, the morbidity rate was slightly lower since 2019 because we were able to expand the dialysis program, CAPD, as well as recently we are establishing the transplants as well. So for the year, there are 13 dialysis machines with 110 patients getting dialysis treatment. Capdigo level four newly started satellite unit and by the watch here, we are going to expand it to 10 dialysis machines and Tamutegam with five. And this is some pictures of you. So is that WHO screening principles apply for CKD? Yes, of course. Why is that? Because early stage CKD is completely asymptomatic. Until CKD stage five patients are asymptomatic, they are not developing any symptoms. So that's why CKD screening is very important. And it's detectable by affordable testings and treatments are effective and available. And disease progression is very well understood and screening treatment must be ongoing, not just a one episode. So that is the conceptual framework of CKD screening. We have to determine the individuals, populations who are level at risk, and then initiate CKD screening. Once the CKD diagnosis is confirmed, we have to risk stratify for staging and prognosis, and then we have to treat in the early stage. So I will give you a few examples why screening is important. This is a 22-year-old, just a young female, who was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes mellitus for 11 years, presented to us with bilateral exurin and frothurin for three months duration. And on admission, her GFR was 22 ml per minute with USCR of 10,330. And yesterday we did a renal biopsy. The unfortunate thing is for 11 years, she didn't undergo a single renal screening until she developed these symptoms. And GFR that time now 22. So this, this is another example why screening is important. This patient, this young male, he's like just 33 years, currently getting dialysis treatment at DJ Chwaunia, waiting live transplant at the teaching hospital in Radhapura. His younger brother was diagnosed with end-stage renal failure, and he underwent live transplant from his own sister. And his own sister is completely fine. His, her screening test was normal and frequent. She underwent screening because she had a daughter nephrectomy. However, this, yeah, this, he was never ever undergone a renal screening test. As previous lecture mentioned, we can have early uh, epigenetics and changing epidemic genetics is possible. If like, this is a genetic factor, right? She's family of CKD, but he presented to us as a crash lander. The serum cracking of more than 1,000. He never underwent a single screening test in his past time. But his sister was fine because he was, she was completely screened. And the other one uh, is the fourth, fourth successful cadaveric transplant recipient. His younger brother also diagnosed with end-stage renal failure, and he was the crash lander to our unit. 
and he was also never screened for renal functions. So the additional consideration, patient education is very, very important and economic rationale. The economic rationale is that, that financial, uh, this, for the screening program, the stratification and treatment, the cost is much, much less than the cost for dialysis, transplantation or CAPD program. So four major topics, selection of candidates, populations for CKD early detection, the relative diagnostic and predictive characteristics of test for kidney disease and their potential cost, the evidence-based treatments that reduce the CKD progression and cardiovascular events, the implementation strategies for CKD early detection and treatment and key factors determining resource allocation and cost effectiveness. So how do we determine the risk population? Everyone with hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, they are at risk of CKD. And high blood pressure, history of preeclampsia, diabetes, past history of AKIs, family history of kidney disease, that is very, very important. And obese patients and occupation and environmental exposures, not only for agrochemicals, any hazards, pain, some constructional workers, they are risk. And past history of ischemic bites, history of leptospirosis, and other kind of medical conditions, including HIV, SLE. So all those group of patients, people are at high risk because we can't do screening for everyone. We have to identify the individuals, people who are at risk, and they need to be early screened, an early diagnose and early treat. So initiation, frequency, and cessation of CKD. There is no hard and fast rule when to initiate the screening, what is the frequency, and when to stop the screening. So we should, we should identify the high-risk group people, and we need to frequently monitor them. So this is a kidney failure risk equation. Anyone can identify it through the Google. When we put the uh, age, sex, TFR, and urine protein creatinine ratio, we can get the kidney failure risk assessment. That determines uh, whether in two years' time or five years' time, patient might need RRT. So that time we can, once we establish the kidney failure risk, if it's more than 3%, these people are high risk for kidney failure in two years' time and need to refer to a nephrologist early. So poor adherence to screening guidelines is one of the major factors for this development of end-stage renal failure. USCR screening in diabetic population in the world is only 42% and hypertension population in USCR screening is only 6%. That's very low value. So, so what are the ideal initial screening tests? Serum creatinine, USCR, serum cystatin C. So we this is the guide to diagnose CKD and the uh, staging of the CKD. Once initial screening done, we need to stage the CKD, whether it's a normal G1, G2, G3A, G3B, G4, or G5. The red areas are high risk groups and the green areas are no or low risk groups. So as we all know, this USCR is less than 30 milligrams per gram or less than three milligrams millimoles, that is normal. 30 to 300 milligrams per gram or 3 to 30 milligrams per millimole, that is subnotrotic range proteinuria, and more than 300 milligrams per gram or more than 30 milligrams per millimole is nephrotic range. So with that, this is how the, with the EGFR, how do we stage the CKD? So the cutoff value beyond CKD, this is CKD stage three. If it's like uh, 30 to 45, we call it as CKD stage three. A, uh, in between, uh, sorry, th th 45 to 60, we call it as CKD stage 3A, and B, if it's 30 to 45. So there is low rates of albuminuria testing. Is that, can we replace urine dipstick test for urine and albumin creatination? No, because urine dipstick test is having very low sensitivity. So USCR is the ideal method with including the serum creatinine. Is that serum cystatin C measurement important? However, in our country, it's not freely available, but serum cystatin C has the additional advantage of operating EGFR estimates that do not require the incorporation of the race coefficient. Cystatin C is more specific than uh, C 
uh, serum creatinine for cardiovascular disease prediction. So I will show why it is important because in the red line, that serum cystatin C is having a linear relationship with all cause mortality and uh, step renal disease progression. But the serum creatinine value is not having a linear relationship because it can be varies with the drugs and muscle mass. So serum, uh, serum creatinine is not having a linear relationship, right? But serum cystatin C is having a linear relationship with the GFR and all cause mortality. And the cystatin C and albuminuria is a better uh, prediction of cardiovascular disease risk than the serum creatinine. So how do we screen? How do we risk stratify? So we have to identify the people who are at risk. As I already mentioned, hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, price to AKI, family history, obese patients, and people who are environmental exposures and genetic factors. Then we start screening with UACR and serum creatinine and available serum cystatin C. How do we diagnose is confirm the CKD after only diagnose it. If the EGFR less than 60 or UACR more than 30 for more than three months, then we define it as chronic kidney disease. Once CKD is confirmed, we have to stage it and then we have to assess the risk factors and modify the risk factors. That is how we risk stratify and then treat them. So lifestyle improvements that definitely may help to reduce the progression of all stages of CKD. This study showed that modifiable lifestyle hazards can predict the incidence of CKD in the community and may inform both public health recommendations and clinical practice. So what are the lifestyle modifications? Smoking cessation, well-balanced diet, fruits, Mediterranean diet, vegetables, legumes, and limiting dietary salt intake. Maintain a healthy weight, regular exercises, including yoga. Advise patients to avoid herbal medicines, neuropathic supplements, NSAIDs, PPIs, and decongestants. Because lots of practice, lots of I'm seeing, we are seeing uh, lots of people with NSAIDs and PPIs who are at high risk of CKD. So this is the pharmacological treatment, just move to the pharmacological treatments, SGL2 inhibitors, SE inhibitors, OAV, statins, and metformin. So this is the renal trial. I think everyone knows about the renal trial. That showed that in diabetic nephropathy patients, they include that losartan treatment group compared to placebo had reduced risk of CKD progression. They mainly include the diabetic nephropathy patients. But the other meta-analysis study showed Diabetic and non-diabetic proteinuric patients, AC inhibitors or ARBs reduce the risk of progression compared to the uh, non-treatment group. But non-proteinuric, it's inconsistent. So this is the other trial, SPRINT trial, which is the largest trial of antihypertensive. Uh, that is a randomized controlled open-label multicenter controlled trial that showed they include patients uh, with uh, non-diabetic CKD also with age 50 years or greater. That showed intensive treatment group compared to the standard group had reduced occurrence of MIs, acute coronary syndrome, stroke, heart failure, death. So that is important, but they used standardized office blood pressure, not the casual office BP. So what is standardized office blood pressure measurement? That patients should be rest in a quiet room, and uh, avoid smoking, caffeine, exercise for more than 30 minutes with empty bladder. And the cuff should be in the bare hand, uh, in mid uh, arm cuff, uh, and calibrated with the uh, validated manual auto blood pressure meter. So if we monitor with this, the target blood pressure should be less than 120 over 80, but that is called standardized office BP measurement. So other studies showed statins. Statins will not reduce CKD progression, but it reduces cardiovascular disease risk, especially beyond CKD stage three. So uh, this study showed that the statins lowered cardiovascular disease, especially age more than 50 years, everyone is having cardiovascular disease risk. Less than 50 other additional risk factors patient people with additional other cardiovascular disease factors need studies, but they will not reduce the CKD progression. Other 
thin glucose control, intensive treatment is reduce the risk of CKD progression in type 2 diabetes with target HPAYC less than 6.5%. So this is a miracle drug, STL2 inhibitors, more than a diabetic drug, I'd like to call it as a cardiac and renal drug, because I will give you a few trials about the STL2 inhibitors. This is a credence trial, that is, uh, they include people with only diabetic nephropathy patients, type 2 diabetes with USCR more than 300 milligrams per gram with the mean age of 62, with mean EGFR of 57, with mean USCR of 927. That patients who were treated with canagliflozin compared to placebo had reduced the risk of kidney failure and cardiovascular disease events. So other trial was DEPA CKD trial. They include both diabetic and non-diabetic, not only diabetic, uh, non-diabetic, both proteinuric patients. And their EGFR was much, much lower. Like uh, It was like EGFR was more than 25 to 75 ml per minute. All patients were in maximum tolerated AC inhibitors. And they, are, they include both diabetic and non-diabetic proteinuric, the DAPA treatment group compared to passive had a statistically, statistically significantly reduced the risk of kidney failure, cardiovascular deaths, and hospitalization for heart failure and all possibly. So that is a really important trial because they include both diabetic and non-diabetic proteinuric with GFR of more than 25. And the other trial was MPA kidney trial. This they include slightly lower EGFR up to 20, 20 to 45 ml per minute paper, and proteinuric patients, significant proteinuria, USCR more than 200. So, impaclifazone treatment group had reduced the CKD progression and cardiovascular disease risk compared to placebo. However, that the risk of ketoacidosis and lower limb amputation was slightly higher with the MPA treated group. So GLP-1 receptor antagonist is not freely available in our country, but we can use it once the EGFR is lower because we can't use SGL2 inhibitors if the EGFR is lower, like less than 25. So then we can use these, but that will reduce only the CKD progression, sorry, uh, cardiovascular disease risk, risk, not the CKD progression. So this is Fidelio DKD trial. It's a randomized double-blind trial, including 5,724 patients with CKD and type 2 diabetes with USCR of more than 30 and EGFR of more than 25 to 70. And all patients were treated with RAS blockage. Treatment with finaron is Lowers the CKD progression. How do we identify the risk? The patient's safety. Once the EGFR less than 60, we need to modify our doses and we need to reduce the risk of AKIs with adequate hydration. We have to avoid volume depletion, avoid dual blockage because some practices I saw AC inhibitors combined with TAPS should not be done. And the other thing to prevent the contrast related AKIs is the lowest possible radio contrast and adequate hydration, withhold AC inhibitors or ops and diuretics prior and metformin prior to the contrast. And in, the, in between EGFR 45 to 60, we have to avoid any states and especially PPIs as well. And in Beyond 30, below 30, we can't use metformin, but 30 to 45, we can use the half dose of metformin. And below 30, we have to avoid NSAIDs, we have to avoid uh, bisphosphonate. Sometimes bisphosphonates are given in when EGFR even less than 30. We should not give bisphosphonates when EGFR is less than 30. And we have to avoid metformin. So patient engagement is critically important. In Improve access to patient healthcare, improve access to adherence to medication, timely nephrology referral, dietitian referral, proper diabetes education, that is important. And patient-related barriers are lack of knowledge of CKD and their associated risks. That's why we are meeting lots of crash landers of CKD and social risk factors, malnutrition, and lack of education. And health system related barriers, lack of knowledge of CKD guidelines, and lack of 
communication. So we can do measures to define success CKD screening program, success CKD stress stratification and treatment. So as patient related like lifestyle modification and education and then treatments. As inhibitors of studies, as I mentioned, all the things earlier. So we need more trials to design these say, testing of CKD early identification and intervention programs. Then I'd like to highlight a few things about risk factors for CKDU, which is uh, which is endemic in some areas in our country. So we don't know exactly what are the risk factors, but it is multifactorial. Heat stress is one of the risk factors. Occupational exposure, inhalation and ingestion of dust and toxins, including agrochemicals, can be reduced with safe practice, wearing PPEs, wearing double gloves, masks, like that. And drinking superficial well water contaminated with agrochemical toxins, any toxin is a risk factor, can be reduced with filtered RO water, and genetic, more than might be genetic or beyond genetic factors, because we are coming across uh, autosomal dominant tubular interstitial disease and then malnutrition. So this is uh, some biopsy findings of a CKDU patient. This is tubular interstitial fibrosis, and interstitial fibrosis with tubular atrophy and glomerular sclerosis and from perigromular sclerosis as well. Still, we don't know. And the intervention trials are not enough, adequate to treat for the CKDU. There, is, there are a few trials. Uh, there's, there's a single center double bind randomized control trial on steroids for patients with CKDU and acute interstitial nephritis confirmed in renal biopsies showed empirical treatment of steroids is a potential treatment to reduce the CKD, but that uh, trial is not is strong enough to prove the treatment benefit. We can try with acute patients who are biopsy showed acute tubular interstitial nephritis with trial steroids. And treatment of hyperuricemia is still, uh, we couldn't get a significant uh, trial evidence and we need more interventional studies. I'll tell about the one trial that is for using with the AC inhibitors. It's a double blind, blind uh, placebo controlled randomized trial. This was conducted to investigate the effect of AC inhibitors on the progression of CKDU. That showed uh, in another pill treatment group is beneficial in reducing albuminuria, but the CKD disease progression reduction is not significant. There is an EGFR decline, reduced reduction in the EGFR decline in inner pill group, but it was not unfortunately statistically significant. So we need uh, more strong evidence about treatment of acidosis, style of steroids, AC inhibitors might be other newer drugs for treatment of CKDU. So need the protocol to improve the health population, long-term follow-up, we need systemic records and longitudinal studies. Thank you. This is Padri Alek. Thank you, Nadisha, for that uh, lecture on the CKDU. The, I have already have two questions on the Q&A. I'll start on those questions first. When is it safe to continue patient with ACI and ARB? And when did you stop them in CKD? So, uh, it's all the patients with proteinuric CKD. It is the first line treatment of choice is AC inhibitors or ARBs. And we'll consider stopping it if there are, once we started it, if there's a rise in uh, uh, spreading or the EGFR drop more than 12.5%. That's if there's a rapid decline in EGFR, we will consider stopping it. And the other things like bilateral renal artery stenosis, patients, when there's a rapid decline in EGFR, we will not consider as inhibitors. Otherwise, 40 uric patients with CKD, that is the number one treatment option. So depending on the, the EGF. EGF. So yeah. the uh, cutoff will be wrong. There is no cutoff value. Usually, uh, if the EGFR is very, very low, well, as that 15, like we will not initiate. But once patient was initiated with AC inhibitors, we will not stop it, even though the patient's EGFR is less than 10. We will continue the drug. 
but we will initiate it. Uh, we will not initiate if the GFR is less than 50, but if it's still proteinuric, there's a beneficial of treating with at least a lower dose. There's a more than 12.5% rise after initiation, we will not continue the drug. Okay, another question. Uh, when will you initiate a screening and how often and whom do you screen? Yeah, that's what, uh, there is no hard and fast rule when to screen. All the people who are at risk of CKD, because we have to initiate screening early because people are asymptomatic. All the patients are asymptomatic until CKD stage five. So all the people who are at risk need to start the screening. There's no age cutoff or something like that because there are people who are, Family histories, they presented with very young age with end stage renal failure. So there's no cutoff age. All the patients who are at risk population group, they need to be early screened and we should not stop the screening. We have to frequently monitor their renal function. That's very important. Uh, geographical areas yes. that you have. Geographical one. areas, uh, family history, obese, diabetic, hypertension. Uh, the past history of AKI, that is also important. Even one, one, when a person had developed an AKI in one episode, they are at very risk of developing CKD. So they need frequent monitoring with renal function and past history of snake bites, leptospirosis infections. And uh, some people, they are having this uh, residual renal function volume is lower, those people. So they can rapidly develop into CKD and they can rapidly progress. Uh, next question is on hyperuricemia in renal patient. Does allopurinol prevent progression of CKD? There's no uh, trial proven benefit of allopurinol, but if in the patients who develop hyperuricemia, we used to treat with uh, allopurinol, uh, but we, we don't have enough trial based evidence. Next, will renal stone cause CKD? Yes. That's why nephrolithiasis patients need to be referred to nephrologist earlier because bilateral this uh, CKDU patients also have came across uh, nephrocalcinosis bilateral and then they later develop into CKD and uh, stage renal failure. So early stage we need to treat for these stones. But once these stones they can do cause uh, bilateral hydronephrosis, hydrouretor, and then thinning of the cortex parenchymas and stage renal failure. So we have to treat, identify the stones. We have to identify which one need to intervene, which one can be medical experts, which one can be medical treat, and then frequent monitoring with the renal functions. Any questions from the physical audience? Yeah, Harsh. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, that's what that trial showed. Even though the, that MPA kidney and DAPA CKD trial, both trials showed that evidence, even though non diabetic proteinuric patients, first we treat with maximum tolerated dose, dose of AC inhibitor, so AR base, and then we have to add the SGL2 inhibitor. We basically, we usually initiate if the EGFR is more than 25. Less than 20, we will not add the SGL2 inhibitor. But more than 25, we have to add the SGL2 inhibitor. And then we can go up to maximum tolerated dose. And even though the patient's GFR declined later, uh, we will not stop the drug even at Yes, yes. Yes, yes. We will first treat with the S inhibitors. If protein urea not settles, we will add SGL2 inhibitor. And so if there is no protein urea settlement, we can add, as I mentioned, phenerone, which is not available in our country. We can try uh, other mineral corticoid receptor antagonists like eplanone or spinalactone, but frequent monitoring of potassium levels.
one more question from virtual doctor ragunathan while thank you for the excellent Hi. overview asking what the glycemic target should be 6.5 or in in high vascular risk it should be 7 usually we go for hba1c less than 6.5 even with the vascular yeah. 6.5 is the idea. Any other questions? In terms of any other questions, again, on behalf of the college, I am very, very much thankful for your coming all the way from Andhradhapur and doing this lecture on mid of the week. Uh, We'll see you in two weeks' time with the specialty update on infections, and four weeks' time with another young physician forum. Thank you very much for everybody.